Hi friends, welcome back to the YouTube channel. So I've taken a little bit of a break while I was getting things set up for our brand new fertility practice. And today I'm excited to jump back in and talk about one of the most common things I'm asked about, which is IVF. Stay tuned for everything you need to know about IVF. Hi friends and welcome back. I have been taking a little bit of a break from producing content, which has been really hard for me, but that is because I'm so excited to announce Fora Fertility, our brand new boutique fertility practice in Austin. So Fora Fertility is started with myself and Dr. Amanda Skiller, and she is my partner in crime. And what we're really trying to do is bring you the latest and greatest modern technology with a very personalized approach. We are trying to think of everything so you don't have to, and so you can just trust us. But aside from that, it's kind of a lot to start a business. And so I had to take a step away from making content, and I'm so thrilled to finally be back and putting it all out there. But so today we are talking about IVF, in vitro fertilization. I love IVF because it is just that high-tech science that gives people a chance to grow their family in ways that keep changing and evolving and becoming more advanced with time. First of all, not everybody who goes to a fertility doctor needs IVF. That is not at all what we're trying to sell or promote. However, it covers the basics for so many different people that it is often what couples need. And if you come to me and tell me, hey, I want the thing with the highest chance of success that's going to get me pregnant the fastest, it is almost always going to be IVF. So I am throwing that out there from the beginning. Today, I'm just going over the concept so you can start to understand this process if you're starting out on the IVF journey, because I think it's so important that doctors and patients speak the same language. And how can you make the decision to do something or if it's right for you, if you don't even know what's involved? Okay, so let's talk about IVF. The first thing is that you have to understand the ovary if we're gonna talk about IVF. All IVF is, is manipulating your ovary for one given month. We're trying to get eggs that would normally die to grow and develop so that they can be taken out of your body and fertilized in the lab. This is what the hormones that you take is all to do. So understanding how the ovary normally works is key. So I like to use the analogy that you have a vault inside your ovary and that's where all your eggs are kept. When you're born, the vault is full. And as you go through your life, eggs come out of the vault and over time, you end up with fewer eggs. When the vault is empty, you're in menopause. That happens to everybody. Everybody goes into ovarian failure and runs out of eggs. What is interesting to us is that we lose a group of eggs every month. And so if you've listened to episodes like age infertility or natural infertility, you've heard me say this. So you have a group of eggs that all come out of the vault. And of these eggs, one is chosen to grow and ovulate and the rest of them die and then next month you have a new group. So what happens is each egg grows inside a follicle. You can't see eggs because they're microscopic, but you can see the follicles. Follicles are small fluid filled structures. And when the vault is full, so when you're young and you have lots of eggs, there are more follicles or more eggs that come out of the vault each month. And when the vault is getting closer to empty, you have fewer follicles or fewer eggs that come out every month. This is helpful to us to understand. So we can check the follicles by doing something called an antral follicle count, AFC. This is where we evaluate the number of follicles you have outside the vault in a given month. And we can also check a blood test called AMH or anti-malarian hormone. These two values are what we call ovarian reserve. Now, these markers of ovarian reserve have nothing to do with your natural fertility in a given month because your body doesn't care if you have 20 eggs come out of the vault or two. One of them is chosen to ovulate in natural cycles. So natural fertility is no different in women who have low ovarian reserve tests. However, for IVF cycles, these are highly important to us. And that is because the only eggs we can get in a given cycle are the ones that have already been released from the vault. We can't tap into the vault. So understanding how many eggs we are expecting to get, number one, sets our expectations appropriately so we can plan if we potentially need more than one cycle. And number two, helps your doctor understand what protocol is the best for you. You should not have a doctor who just does one protocol all the time. That is not how IVF should be done. So the protocol is the combination of hormones that is used to get all of the eggs outside the vault to grow. This is important because 
your body doesn't want to have lots of eggs grow at once because you're not supposed to have lots of babies at once. You can't have 20 eggs ovulate because then you could have a litter of 20 children and the human body cannot handle that. So we have to trick your body and that is what the IVF protocol is. I like to explain the protocol as a combination of a suppression and a stimulation. Think about it this way. 20 eggs come out of the vault, each egg in a follicle. Normally the brain sends out follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. FSH is a well-named hormone that stimulates one egg to grow. The point of this, we're gonna get one to grow, rest will die, you'll ovulate and go on. The point of the suppression in the protocol is to not have the brain send out any FSH. So if the brain doesn't send out any FSH, what happens? You have a group of eggs come out of the vault, FSH is their food and they don't see any. So all their little FSH receptors open wide up. These eggs are not really ready to accept FSH. They're starving, they're looking for it, it's their food. So a suppression phase between two to four weeks can often be very advantageous. The suppression is really what differs in most protocols. So the suppression can be cheap and easy like birth control pills, it can be hormone shots, it can be Lupron, ovulation blockers, estrogens, testosterone, lots of options. The protocol and the choice of suppression should be tailored to you. What is right for you, how old you are, how many eggs we think we'll get, things like that. So you'll use a suppression for a few weeks and that will prevent FSH from being secreted. And now you have a group of eggs that have come out of the vault and they're all very hungry for FSH. Now the fun part starts. You're gonna come in for a baseline ultrasound at the end of your suppression. The point of the baseline is to check that the suppression worked. Baseline ultrasound is to confirm ovaries are quiet or that no eggs are growing. Then you're gonna start the stimulation, which is what most women talk about when they say they started their hormone shots for IVF. The stimulation are the natural hormones that your body makes. So it's FSH, large, large doses of FSH, and often a little bit of LH. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, that same hormone that gets an egg to grow, you're now giving in much higher doses than normal. That is purposeful. Now that FSH can go and fill up all those receptors that are open, and now we've tricked your body in order to get all of the eggs outside the vault to grow. The stimulation phase is giving yourself daily shots. It is, I can't make that better. You give yourself shots, they're a tiny little needle, they're into the fat or the subcutaneous tissue right in your belly area. They are daily shots for approximately two weeks. During the course of that stimulation, you're gonna be coming in for monitoring. So monitoring are the frequent visits to the RE's office so we can see how you're responding. Monitoring includes an ultrasound and maybe blood work to check your estradiol levels. Estradiol is a type of estrogen made from eggs. Typically monitoring appointments are every two to three days. So ultrasound, blood work, leave. What we do it for is we try to make this as easy as possible in your life. So you would come into our office for a very brief appointment in the morning. We are not like quadruple booking these. I do not want you sitting in my waiting room for an hour, especially not in the time of COVID. And we'll be drawing your blood on site and then you'll go on with your life. And when the results come back, the team will make a plan and you'll hear from your fertility nurse and then we'll come back a few days later. So we'll be very controlling, making sure we have the right dose, we don't need to make any changes. Do we have to add in an ovulation blocker based on your protocol? It all depends. Now typically your first few monitoring appointments are set. So every two to three days, boom, 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 boom. Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But then I don't know if you'll grow your eggs at the average or a little faster, or a little slow. And so you would see usually a range on your calendar that would say possible egg retrieval. The egg retrieval is the most invasive part of this process. So the egg retrieval is how we go in and we actually get the eggs out of your body. The egg retrieval is done under anesthesia. It is an IV anesthetic that you're still breathing on your own, so no breathing tube. And you go in vaginally with a large needle attached to the ultrasound and you enter the ovaries that way. You drain these fluid filled follicles and you get test tubes full of your eggs. It is a low risk, but not a no risk procedure. The day the eggs are retrieved, they're also going to be fertilized with sperm. So there's two different ways for fertilization for IVF. So one is ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. That is taking the egg, cracking it open, picking up a sperm with a catheter and inserting it into the egg. That is often done if we're doing genetic testing, if there's any type of male factors, if there's unexplained infertility. There's also conventional fertilization, how IVF was first invented, was you would take a Petri dish and you put the eggs in it and you'd squirt the sperm on top and you'd cover it and you'd put it in the incubator. And then the next day you'd pull it out and you'd see how many fertilize. Sometimes conventional fertilization leads to no fertilization if fertilization is part of the issue. 
because you're not really helping the egg and sperm meet. Most of us are doing a large number of ICSI cases to prevent against this. It is devastating to pull out the dish and have nothing fertilized. So if there's something we could do that potentially would overcome that problem, I like to do it now. Not every egg you get is gonna make it to embryo and going to become a baby. And sometimes we say IVF is an expensive diagnostic procedure, and that's hard to hear. But that's important to know that there's no guarantees that some people will need another cycle and that some cycles can result in no embryos. And these things are really hard. But I think that women are very strong. And so as long as you set the pathway correctly and you know all these things can happen and you've talked about them, you could handle it if it happened to you. Okay, so then the next day you find out how many fertilized. That's done on a FERT check. Most labs will notify you and you're not gonna expect complete fertilization. Usually it's around 70, 75%. So not every egg you get will be mature. Not every mature egg will fertilize. Not every fertilized egg will make it to an embryo. Not every embryo will be genetically normal and not every genetically normal embryo will implant. So there's a lot of loss along the way and that's really hard. But understanding what goes on and what to expect is helpful. So of the fertilized eggs, they then have to grow out into the stage of embryo called the blastocyst. Now previously when IVF first came around, we transferred embryos on day two and three because we didn't have the right culture mechanism to take them all the way to that normal implantation stage of a blastocyst. We now exclusively in my lab take them all the way to blastocyst. I haven't done a day three transfer in years and years and years. And that's because it's better to have the embryos select themselves out in the lab and transfer the strongest embryos with the best chance of surviving. And if embryos aren't gonna make it in the perfect environment of the lab, I'd rather know about it so that we can get you to that next cycle instead of wasting time transferring. You're going to have loss. So if we get 20 eggs, let's say that 18 are mature, let's say that 14 of them fertilize, and let's say that seven of them make it through to the blastocyst stage. That would be a pretty average cycle based on loss. So you started at 20 and here you are at seven, and that's before genetic testing. That blastocyst is about 200 cells. It's the normal stage of implantation. It's day five or day six. The blastocyst is about 200 cells. So all the outer cells, imagine a soccer ball. Everything you can see is the trophectoderm. That's the placenta. And then inside in the hollow portion is a little tiny ball of cells called the inner cell mass. And that's what becomes the baby. At this stage, three different things can happen. An embryo can be transferred, embryos can be frozen, or embryos can be biopsied and then frozen for genetic testing. Which options are available to you will depend on your clinical situation. Most of the time, if you're getting a large number of eggs, you are no longer a candidate for a fresh transfer. The more eggs you make, the higher estrogen level you have, and that may negatively impact success rates with transfer in addition to predisposing you to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So candidates for me for fresh transfers are young patients who are not worried about needing genetic testing, who are not gonna get very many eggs because we're not worried about overstimulation or endometrial receptivity. So it's a very, very narrow window. So most of my patients, we cross it out. Freezing your embryos, that's an option. And sometimes we do that because you're a high responder and we just wanna give time to sync up the uterus and the embryos. So that means you would freeze all the embryos, have a period, and then in the next month, you would do a frozen embryo transfer. That's where we get the uterine lining ready and then we transfer an embryo. The other option is to do genetic testing, which is becoming more and more popular. When we talk about genetics, there's two main options here to test for. One is to test for genetic diseases that are single gene defects like cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy. But most of the time we're doing PGTA, which is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or random chromosome abnormalities. As we've talked about before, when those chromosomes split at the time of ovulation, the older you are, the more your proteins break down, and the more likely you are to have an abnormal chromosome split. This can lead to genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome and other lethal abnormalities. Now, the vast majority of chromosome abnormalities from IVF do not implant. They cause negative success rates or they miscarry. It's not that they actually result in children being born from them, but by understanding which embryos are genetically normal, we can have a much higher rate of success at time of transfer. All embryos that are genetically tested, they get frozen, so they're automatically going to be a frozen embryo transfer. And success rates can be normalized for age once you get a genetically normal embryo. So you can have live birth rates of as high as 70%. Otherwise, you're gonna see IVF success rates are very dependent on age, where the highest success in the lowest age category. So if you're under the age of 30, your chance of success with transferring one embryo is gonna be around 50 to 55% if it's not tested. And the older you get, if you get closer to 
over age 40, then it's going to be around 20%. We can normalize this and go way over if we do genetic testing and that is hugely advantageous. Depending on your long-term goals, you may elect to do multiple cycles, and this is really confusing, but I like to separate it in our mind. Think of IVF, in vitro fertilization, the act of getting the eggs out of your body, fertilizing them in the lab and making embryos, plus minus doing genetic testing. And then you have FET, which is the frozen embryo transfer. That is transferring the embryo into the body. Very often, women can get one round of IVF if you're young and you have good egg quality, and have multiple embryos and then do multiple FETs if needed. Whether it's one and you get pregnant and then in a couple years you can do another transfer for baby two or three, or if that first one doesn't work and you have another embryo, you can go right into another transfer. You don't have to start right over at the beginning, but that's not always the case. Some couples I counsel, hey, because of low ovarian reserve or expected genetic normalcy with your age, I think we're gonna need multiple cycles of IVF before a transfer and we call this embryo banking. What this means is you may go through one round of IVF, get out eggs, make them into embryos, do genetic testing, see what you get, and then do another round of that before you jump on to the embryo transfer stage of things. Frozen embryo transfers, for the most part, are much easier. The hormones are more mild, you're not undergoing any invasive procedures, there's no anesthesia, the transfer feels like a pap smear. It is loading an embryo into a small catheter and just placing it into the uterus. That is usually well tolerated and you are wide awake. So IVF is the part that has more hormonal swings, you're giving yourself shots, and you're undergoing the invasive procedure. The last thing I want to say about IVF is this is a super brief overview just to give you an idea of the terminology and what we're talking about. We're going to have to go in depth in things like protocols, understanding what's right for you, different types of frozen embryo transfers, top things to ask your doctor in your clinic. There is so much to dive in to IVF. IVF is not a guarantee. That's one of the hardest things about this. 70% is great to me in the field, but that's notably not 100. That means every perfectly looking, genetically normal embryo will not become a baby. And we've got to know that from the beginning. That's hard, but that's not impossible. We are here to guide you, so your RE is all over. We're here to help you get from point A to point B. We want desperately for you to have success, but personally, I'm not gonna paint a rosy picture if it's not. If you're running a marathon, I don't want you to think you're running a mile. I want you to know this is a marathon and we can do it. And how can we set you up for success the best? So if there's things you wanna know and questions, please, please ask below. That way I can make sure that we get everything answered. Thank you guys so much for listening to this video. I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. I know that sounds silly, but it helps get my message out to more people. And what I really wanna do is make it so that women who are looking for information about fertility and IVF get great evidence-based information to help them plan for their fertility journey. So the more you subscribe, the more you like, the more you comment, the more that this will get to the women who need it the most. You can always follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. And I also have the As a Woman podcast, which is full of fertility based information as well as female empowerment for you to listen to as well. Thank you guys so much for listening. Can't wait to hear what you have to say.